Welcome everyone to CW Live. I'm Natasha Nicholson, Executive Editor of IBC's magazine, Communication World. And today I'll be talking with Yukai Chow. Yukai is one of the earliest pioneers in gamification. He created the gamification, gamification framework, Octalysis, and he's the author of the book, Actionable Gamification Beyond Points, Badges, and Leaderboards. In October, he'll be leading a gamification workshop with the same title for IABC, uh, which we're very excited about. Welcome, Kai. Uh, th thank you for thank you for uh, inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Well, let's start here. What are some of the potential benefits of gamification, and how can a communicator convince their leadership that it's an important role in the workplace? So, gamification is essentially taking the motivating fun aspects of games and applying it into things that are important and useful like education training you know healthcare product design and it really roots into deep psychological design behavioral design so if you can create an environment where people not only take what we call the desired actions but they also do it joyfully they enjoy what they're supposed to do more and you can change behavior through that that system, of course, it's always going to be useful, right? Whether it's for yourself to do things you want to do, but don't have the motivation to do it, or for your employees to work harder, but not only harder, but happily and you know more productively and more sustainably, or get your uh, clients or customers to come back every day and use your product and tell people about it. That's always useful in any kind of aspect. Um, now, the hard part is that because there's the word game in it, sometimes there's a hard uh, people have a hard time convincing their executive team about using it because people have a pre-notion that, oh, game, you know, I don't, we don't play games, that's for little kids, it's a distraction. And so that's usually when you have to uh, show them all these great case studies out there now. Now, right now we're, we're pretty lucky in the sense that when I started Gamecation in 2003, when I started working on it, uh, there was nothing out there. Right? And nowadays there's, also, there's all, a lot of these case studies. So I've put together a page of the 90 plus uh, case studies uh, of gamification with ROI stats. So Google did this, increased their core metrics by 73%. Uh, Cisco did that and increased their other metrics by you know 43%. You know HP. And so when you show your executives, hey, this is not just fun and exciting and, and trendy, but an action, and, but very legitimate companies are using it and they're really increasing their core metrics by double digits. Then I think. Executives are more open to thinking. Oh wow, let me let me let me look more into what this is about. So so I think uh, you want to start with value value creation. Why is it worth executives' time? Because they they understand. Well, you want to have fun, but that's cool. But what is in for me and what is in for the company? And I think that's very important to tell them the, the success cases. Well, let's break that down a little bit. What would you say are some of the common misconceptions that companies have around? Gaming? Um, there are quite a few. I think. I would say the two most uh, common misconceptions one, gamification is about games, and that's completely incorrect. Gamification is applying the fun elements of games into serious work. So we, I always tell people, hey, look, the, difference, the biggest difference between gamification and games is that gamification focuses on driving results. So if it does not increase your business metrics, it's a distraction. You need to throw it away. right? Even if it's fun, cool, exciting, if it does not actively increase the business metric that you formally declared, like you know, user adoption, you know, virality or uh, productivity increase, it's a distraction. That's a that's a game. You throw it away. But gamification, everything that's designed to do, everything that motivates people, are meant to increase those desired actions, which in turn increase those business metrics. So basically, the more they play, the more the, the numbers, the more of your metrics go up, and that's important to recognize. It's it's basically. They're having fun, but they're doing what you want them to do, which is you know, whatever you want to define as a desired behavior. The second part is gamification or uh, is, is basically just applying what we call the PBLs, the points, badges, and leaderboards. So people think, oh, once we put on points systems into, into their workflow or add some badges, things will be fun and exciting. And that just doesn't work that way. And if you look at games, for instance, you know, Every game in the market has what we call game elements, you know, points, badges, narrative, quest, whatnot. But most games are still not fun. Most games are not successful. Only a very few amount of uh, well-designed games achieve a very high success rate. And so it's pretty unrealistic to think that, hey, if we just take those game elements that are even found in boring games and put into my workplace, it automatically becomes 
uh, successful. That just doesn't happen. And we also know it's not about the graphics. And you know, I spend years studying games that are very similar. Sometimes one is just a clone of the other. But somehow the visually stunning game, you know, sometimes one's way prettier. The, the visual stunning game is a huge success or a huge failure. But the ugly game, think about Minecraft, right? Not not so visually stunning, uh, becomes the, the the breakout success. So it's not the it's not the visuals. It's really how they appeal to our core psychology, which ex extends into the framework that that I created called Octalysis. So I think the, the, again, the two big uh, misconceptions: not just games, not playing games. It's really doing work in a fun way. And then two, it's not just about slapping on game elements, but it's about deeper. Uh, engaging design. Well, talking a little bit more about that, you said that success in gamification is more than just having a sleek design or a leaderboard. And you've talked about the fact that it requires an understanding of human motivation. Can you say more about that? Yes. So, gamification, actually, um, you know, there's a lot of confusion about the term gamification and a lot of people don't like the term. I, pers I personally feel like a better term for gamification is what we call human focused design as opposed to function focused design. So most systems are function focused. They, uh, they assume people in the system will take the desired action and then it optimizes for um, usability, you know, efficiency, you know, functionality. So if you think about it as a factory, right, you assume people in the factory do their work because you pay them. And then you try to figure out how to improve your workflow and get people to, you know, get uh, maximize production. A human focused design remembers that people in a system have feelings, have motivations, have insecurities, have reasons why they do or do not want to do something, and it optimizes for that. So that's kind of like a theme park where you design it to be really, really fun, and then you can predict that people automatically want to line up for hours and hours just to enjoy the experience. Now, what's interesting here is that in the case of a factory, you're paying people to do the mundane task, the desired behavior. In the case of a theme park, they're actually paying you to stand in line for hours and hours. Now, the reason why we call this gamification, why it's so important uh, in terms of our psychological behaviors, is that the gaming industry is the first to, uh, to master human focused design. Because if you think about it, there's absolutely no purpose to playing a game. You never have to play a game. Right, you have to, you know, do your taxes, go to work, you know, do your homework. Even if you don't like it, you just suck it up and do it. But for a game, again, you never have to play a game. The moment a game is no longer fun, you leave the game. You know, you play another game. You, uh, you know, you go on YouTube. You check your emails, right? So, because games have spent all these decades or even centuries, depending on how you qualify a game to figure out how to get people to come back every single day, spend four, five, six hours doing repetitive actions like throwing out a bird or mashing three gems. Um, and we're learning from that. That's why we call it gamification. And this is really important in the field of marketing or new product launches because almost by definition, when you have a new product, you know, no one, ha no one has to use your product, right? You know, their lives were fine before, before you had the product. So the moment you're not interesting, the moment you're not engaging, they leave. So you have to think about, okay, how do I appeal to people's psychological core drives to attract them in, to, to really make them want to consume your content, your information, you know, you know and, and soak in your communications. So, so a lot of time it goes into those core drives. Now, what I have done for many years is I've, again, I've stu studied a lot of games and about why people spend so much time. And this is like, the little scientists in me. So every game is like a petri dish with like hundreds of thousands or millions of test subjects in it. And you can observe that, oh, when this game design changes, everyone decides to do this. When there's too much loss and avoidance design, penalty design, yeah, people take action quickly, but they quickly burn out. When there's more unpredictability, oh, people do this. So essentially, we derive out how people um, make choices and change their behavior in a voluntary environment. And this is why we use that to do good game patient work. You've developed a gamification framework, uh, which you call Octalysis. Mm -hmm. And it includes eight core drives for engaging with games. Can you give us a brief overview of the framework? And let's talk about why it's important. Yes. So uh, after many years of study, I you was know, studying games. I derived, I realized that all the successful games they have all the game elements the failed one has. They have the visual graphics. But what I realized that they have that the failed games don't have is they 
have what I call the eight core drives. So these are the psychological core drives that motivate us to do every single thing we do. So every action you take is based on one or more of these eight core drives, which means that if there's none of those eight core drives there, there's zero motivation, no behavior happens. And it's uh, called octalysis because it is graphed on a oct on an octagon shape with the eight core drives. Now, the the interesting thing about the eight core drives, uh, I guess I'll quickly uh, cover them. So the core drive one is epic meaning and calling. Uh, core drive two is called development and accomplishment. Core drive three, empowerment of creativity and feedback. Core drive four, ownership and possession. Core drive five, social influence and relatedness. Core drive six is scarcity and impatience. Core drive seven is unpredicted curiosity. And core drive eight is loss and avoidance. Now, the interesting thing about these eight core drive is that the nature of the core drives are very different too. We have what we call the white hat core drives, which are the ones on the top. And white hat core drives make us feel powerful, in control. We feel good when we do it, but there's but there's no sense of urgency. Then we have the black hat core drives that create a sense of urgency. It creates obsession, sometimes even addiction. However, it doesn't leave it, it doesn't leave a good taste in our mouths afterwards because we feel like we're not in control of our own actions. And so, um, a lot of times. The white hat are things that once we do it, we're happy, we, we feel good about it, but we always procrastinate because there's no urgency. What we end up doing is all the black hat stuff that drives obsession and, and urgency, the scarcity, the exclusive offers, the deadlines that are that are coming up, the you know expiring opportunities, and you know what's on Facebook, what's on what's on Pinterest, unpredictability. Then on the left side, we have what we call the left brain core drives, which is not necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean it's geographically on the left side of your brain, but it corresponds to um, things, the logical brain. So if things like ownership, things like uh, feeling of accomplishment or goal oriented, uh, feel, and also things you can't have. So the left brain core drives deal with what we call extrinsic motivation. So these are things that you do for a goal, for a reward, for a purpose, but you don't necessarily like the activity itself. It's like people say, hey, do these things you don't like and here's a reward, you know, here's a prize, here's a sweepstakes, which is oftentimes used in, uh, in marketing. Then we have the right brain core drives, which deals with our, with our emotional creative brain. And so those are things that you just enjoy doing, things that you would, you like it so much that you would even pay people money in order to do. So things like empowerment of creative feedback, using your creativity, social influence, you know, spending time with your friends and your loved ones, and also uh, unpredictable curiosity. So you don't need a reward to be in that suspense of unpredictability. In fact, if you think about uh, a scenario where if you, sit, if you press a button for four hours and you're guaranteed a paycheck, that's kind of boring, right? That's just a you know a, a job at a factory. People don't like that. But if you sit there for and press a button for four hours, and maybe you'll get a paycheck, maybe you won't, maybe you even lose money, then hey, that's casino gambling. That's fun suddenly, right? But obviously the payout is a lot worse. So we're literally paying for that unpredictability because our brain craves that. So. Uh, in, in the framework, you not only look into how to create motivation, but you want to look into how do you create the right type of motivation. Things that drive urgency, things that uh, get people to, uh, to work for, for longer, or things that make people enjoy the work versus things that just basically you throw out a carrot for people to follow. So that's, that's the premise of the framework. And again, without any of these core drives, there's no motivation. So a lot of times you want to see if there's any at all, but if there are, you want to be sensitive to the, to the nature of that motivation. Well, how should businesses adapt their games to different forms of motivation? And will they all achieve the same outcome? Or are some drives more influential for achieving a particular goal? So no one core drive is better than all the other ones. Again, they, they accomplish different goals. So if you're looking into employee motivation, right? That's, you're thinking about the long haul. You don't want them to burn out. So that a lot of time is what we call the white hat core drive. So for instance, things like epic media and calling make them feel like they're working for a purpose, that they're actually impactful. They're making a difference in the world. Uh, development accomplishment, giving them a clear path to mastery, feeling that they're progressing, you know, they're getting their promotions, they're leveling up. Um, empowerment of creativity and feedback, which is giving them the autonomy, the ability to, to, to experiment, make choices, use their creativity, seek feedback and adjust. And so those, are good for um, employee motivation. So if you look at Google in the early days, they, they had all three of those, right? They had the purpose, which is, you know, we do know evil and we organize the world's information. They had the development accomplishment, which is the, you know, 
not every engineer could be a manager, but now there's like nine levels of engineers. So you go from level three engineer to level four engineer to level five engineer. So you feel the progression of your career. Uh, then there's the autonomy, which is the 20% time where Google says, you know, 20, you know, one day out of the week, you can work on anything you want as long as the IP belongs to Google. And so a lot of uh, a lot of engineers with great ideas, they don't want to leave Google to start their own companies because they can comfortably try out new things just in Google itself. Now, when it comes to sales or e-commerce, you know, marketing, a lot of times it's not, you know, a lot of them don't care about long-term sustainability, but they should. But a lot of them that they just want people to go on their site, buy as quickly as possible, and leave. So in that case, they use black hat techniques like loss and avoidance. Right. Oh, if you don't act now, this deal is going to run out or scarcity and patience, which is, oh, this exclusive offer is just for you. You're special. You know, it's 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 a uh, it's premium. And then the unpredictable curiosity. Oh, what's going to happen next? If you look at a website like Wooch.com, which was uh, bought by Amazon for a billion dollars, uh, they only utilize two core drives, unpredictability and scarcity. So every day there's one product. You don't know what the next product is until you know midnight and then the next product pops out. And if you wait too long, if you wait till 9 a.m., the, the product's already sold out. So, so that trains people to log in every day at 11.59 p.m. Uh, and just refresh, refresh, refresh the page because they want to see what's going to come out next, and then they can quickly snatch it up. So, so it, again, these core drives create different goal, goals. Now, the left brain core drives, the extrinsic motivation, they hook people into an experience faster. So if you tell them, hey, look, it's a lot of fun. Why don't you try it out? A lot of people won't budge, but if you say, "Hey, if you join, you'll get this cash prize. You'll get a thousand dollars." Now, people suddenly they can justify, "Hey, let me try it out." But if they just go in because of that extrinsic reward, then once they get got the reward, they're done. They leave. They don't even care about what you're doing. So you need that right brain intrinsic core drive to really make things interesting, so that even when the price is gone, the prize is gone, they still want to stay because they're such having such a great time. And when it comes to your marketing too, again, um, it's all about that fun, exciting marketing that you want to engage. Obviously, yeah, if you if you do this stuff, you'll get a prize. You'll or you'll you'll buy the product hopefully, and that is the reward. Um, but the marketing itself needs to be fun, interesting, exciting. It needs to have a lot of social proof, the relatedness. Hey, look, people like you are doing the same thing. Oh, that's nice. Then I should then I feel more comfortable doing it. Um, so again, it really depends on your goals and and different goals use. Uh, requires different strategies. So, so no, um, not all companies using these core drives will achieve the same results. It depends on what strategies they do based on these core drives. But second is, is it depends on how well they do it, right? Just like again, games. Some, you know, some games utilize unpredictability really, really well, and some games don't. They try some unpredictability, but then it it actually instead of excites people and unsettles people. It's like you know, it's tied to too much black hat, and people feel like they immediately. Uh, want to want to burn out quickly. So last question, do you have an example of a company that's leading in the space and maybe specifically talking about how they've demonstrated that gamification led to their goals or you know was successful for the organization overall? Yeah, so and and I have a pretty high standard of gamification. I haven't seen some company that consistently uses gamification well and and does break now mo a great example that most people overlook is eBay. eBay is actually one of the, the earliest successful e-commerce gamified uh, uh, websites, right? Uh, if you just think of a generic, you know, e-commerce website, it's not necessarily intuitive to have this competitive bidding system, to have this, you know, this uh, path, this this mutual feedback system, this way to level up, right? You go from a yellow star seller to a purple star to a power rated seller. And so they started very early on, and you know they they uh, they obviously do very well. I think they were worth uh, I think like 30, 40 billion dollars um, these days. And so so, but most people don't think of that as gamification. They say, oh, it's just eBay. Um, but you know, I think nowadays as a corporation, they've been they've been uh, losing some of their roots of that gamified design. Uh, because they're trying to be more like Amazon, but in fact, Amazon uses a lot of gamification design too. If you think about all that social proof, social design, it's about oh, people like you are doing this, you know, and all it's about the reviews and comments. It also tells you about the, this is a top 1,000 reviewer, right? And there's little things that we call desert oasis and glowing choice game game techniques within Amazon. So so they use that too. 
uh, in a little bit more implicit manner. We talked about Google in the early days through their employee motivation campaign, used a lot of that white hat core drives. I think one uh, company that I'd really like to talk about <clears throat> is a company that got bought by, by Google, which is Waze. So Waze is a GPS app, right? And, and a navigation app on your phone. And when you think about a GPS navigation app, you think it's not, it's not really fun, right? It's really functional, like a tool. You know, you turn left, you turn right, you get your destination. It's again, it's very functional, not, not fun. And so what, what Waze has done is they add a lot of fun, little playful gamified elements into the app. And again, when they enter the market, the market was popular, was, uh, was populated with, with huge companies with a lot of money, a lot of huge budget. They have to do something to differentiate. So, and they do a lot of you know, little cute things that some of them are a little too fluffy in my opinion. But what I really uh, respect was that they put in a lot of Epic Media and Calling into Core Drive 1 into their experience. So in the early days when you first sign up, what you see, they, they first show you an image. On the left side, it's a huge snake monster. The snake monster is made of a road with cars stuck on it. And this snake monster's name is called Traffic. On the right side, you see little brave you know, knights, wazers. You know they're cute and they're and they're they're trying to work together to fight this huge, huge traffic monster. And below it says, "Be traffic together." So when you are driving with ways on, you're not just you know, turning left and turning around, getting your destination. You are actually helping a community of of uh, brave uh, knights, right, wazers, fight this huge monster called traffic. And again, no one likes traffic, right? Everyone hates traffic. So you want to drive with Waze as often as possible so you help the community. When you're driving with Waze on, you feel like you have epic meaning. And so because of that, off, you know, especially in the early days, uh, some, as a user-generated GPS, uh, sometimes it takes you to the wrong place. It's not very accurate. And most of the time, if you fail in your core competency, the, the one thing you promise people you do, which is taking people to the right place, uh, most people say, oh, this is a piece of crap. I'm going to delete it. The powerful thing about ways and this epic meaning calling is sometimes, a lot of times actually, when it takes people to the wrong place, instead of deleting it, people say, oh crap, the map is broken. I need to go and fix it. You know, how powerful is that? When you tell, when you fail at your core competency, people don't get mad at you, they panic and they want to fix you. And this is because epic meaning calling is a drive that's not about what I want, right? Every other drive is about, oh, what do I get? Suspense, uh, ownership and possession social influence. Epic Minion Calling is how I can give to that bigger vision. It's about that self-sacrifice. And so when they actually design that into their experience, you know, they create you know, literally a lot of fans, a cult of people saying, well, we need to improve this thing. And I think uh, I've, I've, I've been impressed by how well they did that. And obviously, over I think five, six years, they also got bought by Google for around a billion dollars. Well, Yukai, I want to thank you so much for joining us on this episode of CW Live. It's been so interesting. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being here. And to our viewers, you can learn more about Yukai's gamification workshop by going to the link that will be posted with this description. And thanks for watching. Thank you.